Good morning, sir. Yeah, you can good start, morning, sir. sir. Yeah, good morning. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, today we are having a uh, case discussion on uh, oral cancer. Dr. Anish Kumar Pandey is a third year uh, DNB resident at RKM Shah Pradeshan Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences. We will present the case. And with us today is uh, Professor Chintamani, uh, who needs no introduction. So, uh, Professor Chintamani will be taking us through this uh, case presentation. Uh, Anish, you can share your screen and start presenting. Yes. Sir, uh, can uh, sir, I ask Milin to share the screen. Milin, please. You can present, please. Start. Good morning to all of you, respected sir. Myself, Dr. Anish Kumar Pandey, third year postgraduate training from uh, RTMSP Wings, Kolkata. I am going to present a case on the oral cavity cancer. My patient particulars. My patient, 44 year female, uh, housewife by occupation, resident of Medinipur, West Bengal, belonging to a low socio-economic socio status, presented to us with cheap complaint now, ulcer over the right side of the tongue for the last three months. The history of presenting illness. The patient uh, was apparently all right three months back. Then she noticed an ulcer on the right side of the tongue three months back, which was insidious in onset started as a small ulcer of size, approximately one centimeter in diameter, progresses to a size three times the initial size in the three months. The ulcer was associated with pain over the ulcer pain, which was for the last 10 days, which was insidious in onset, dull aching, continuous pain referred to the same side of ear, aggravated by speech, food intake or accidental bites, not relieved with any medication. There is a history of excessive salivation present, history of difficulty in speech present. There is no history of halitosis, bleeding or active discharge, dysphagia, difficulty in mouth opening or movement of tongue, loss of weight or loss of appetite, cough, neck swelling. Past history. So may I proceed? Yeah, carry on. You finish up the history. Yes, there, is no the history of, there is no history of similar complaints in the past. The history of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus diagnosed one month back and she is on OHA, uh, oral hypoglycemic agent. History of tooth extraction followed by denture since two years back. She complains of a frequent irritation of denture. History, no history of other comorbidities, no history of any high risk behavior, no history of any radiation exposure in the past. Personal history. She consumes mixed diet. She has normal sleep and appetite, normal bowel and bladder habits, no known allergies, history of beta nut chewing for last 15 years, non-smoker, non-alcoholic, no history of tobacco chewing, menstruation, regular cycle and normal flow, married with two children, normal vegetable. Family history, no significant history of similar illness in the family. Um, there is no significant allergic history. There is no treatment history so for the uh, for the present disease. Right. Yeah. Uh, a good history, but uh, certain stereotypes remain and that need to be sorted out. One is, uh, what do you mean by no history of similar complaints in the past? What are the complaints now? Sir, uh, ulcer in the right side of the tongue. So there is no history of ulcers in the tongue in the past. Mm -hmm. You see, when, actually, I'll tell you what. <laughs> when you use this term, no history of similar complaints in the past, <clears throat> you're putting a lot of importance to what the patient has told you, believing that the patient understands the whole problem. He or she does not understand it. So you should be more specific. What specific past history you would like to take? Sir, so same similar complaint like any ulcer, ulcerative lesion in the past or any... Uh... 
See, this complaint is different from any complaint that he had in the past. Naturally, he did not have any cancers in the past, right? So basically, I mean, whenever you're taking any history, whether it is history of present illness, past history, you should be more precise with what you want to convey. Firstly, I, I'm glad you understand why do you need a past history. You need to know whether there was a history of ulcers in the past or certain precancers which would actually indicate that it's got some relevance for future. To be just lazily asking, no, any, no, no history of similar complaints in the past is a very casual state. That is important. Now, uh, the otherwise the history in these cases is pretty straight. There is no confusion. It made it even straighter by mentioning that there is pain in the tongue with radiation to the ipsilateral ear. Any radiation to any other place? Yes. Now, what does this radiation to the ear would indicate? Sir, it indicates an involvement of the lingual nerve, which causes the referred pain via the auricular temporal nerve. That's fine. So, tongue lesions, even if they are benign, may produce a pain of that nature. So, that is important. Now, onset is insidious. What does that mean? Sir, uh, without any associated with them. There are two parts to any problem. It's onset and it's problem. And then it's culmination. Sir, uh, as you said that she has got an ill-fitting denture. Then the history may start like this. Patient has got an ill-fitting denture and which is causing local irritation. And then she uh, noticed the ulcer there. Because you have already mentioned in the history that she has got a dental action, ill-fitting denture is there, which is causing irritation. So the onset may be preceded by this irritation and then the ulcer came. Uh, right. Doc. Uh, the other thing, uh, Dr. Sa, the usual way they would put it is onset is insidious. Onset one morning she or he noticed or she noticed that there is an ulcer. Am I right? Yes, sir. Before that morning, there was no ulcer, no? Sir, she complains of little irritation, but nothing like that, sir. No ulcer. And Please understand, when you are when you're narrating the story of the illness, onset sudden happens only in very, very rare circumstances. The patient notices at that point. It must have been happening for some time. So as Dr. Saha suggested to you, if you had mentioned about the irritation proceeding to ulceration, then we know the onset was gradually. The ulcer happened over a period of time. But when and when the ulcer happened, it happened on that day. Please uh, try to understand. Onset of events which happen like pain abdomen or bleeding per rectum, hematuria, this could be onset is sudden. No, no gradually noticed episodes. But the term is usually not factually correct. So if you put it as ulcer, irritation over a period of time and then ulcer happening, one can understand, yeah, the whole problem was gradually progressing to that level. Right? And there is no problem. People won't notice this. But I'm noticing and telling you, insidious onset, this should be very clear. Because the day patient noticed it, it was sudden. Patient did not know before that there was an ulcer. Unless the patient was noticing a problem in that region like the irritation as well. Rest is fine. Now, associated with pain over the pain over the ulcer for 10 days. Now, this association, so the ulcer was painless to begin with? Yes. For two months, it was absolutely painless. That's what you're saying? Yes. It's a little discomfort only, sir. No pain. So therefore, again, the terms which are very carefully used, so patient could not have been absolutely comfortable and certainly noticed the pain unless it happened. Please tell us. Did it happen suddenly? The pain happened just 10 days back? Sir, she was uh, she was feeling little discomfort, but pain started, sir, uh, 10 days back. Okay. And then you mentioned it was insidious in onset. Now, 10 days is very recent. In 10 days it happened. So don't use the term insidious so casually. That's how that's what brought my attention to the term insidious. When you already described pain over 10 days, then this insidious business goes away. It was dull aching straight away. Get to that point. Yes, sir. And, and more so, more so the, the classical painless ulcer is a syphilitic ulcer, which is not there nowadays. 
So somebody having a lesion in the uh, epithelial surface, uh, which is a somatic supply, patient might have some discomfort. It may not be excruciating pain, but patient may have some discomfort or dull ache in the site of ulcer. Right, not relieving with medication. Shall we next slide? See, most of this negative history, I'm just making it better. You made a good presentation. Don't worry about that. History of salivation is present. This is not required. It's not a question of being present or absent in a class. There is history of excessive salivation, difficulty of speech. That's it. So they are, I mean, you don't need to put it down in terms of presence or absence. While there is no history of halitosis, bleeding, dysphagia, difficulty in mouth opening or loss of, everything is falling into one place. Loss of weight or appetite in tongue lesions is not common. So don't give it the kind of importance you've given it. And cuff would proceed before that because that is more useful to the local issues. Cachexia is not common with tongue lesions, head and neck lesions. Can you tell us why? Sir, because cachexia occurs due to the release of the cachexin, which occurs due to the production of the TNF alpha or beta, which released after the uh, large, very large necrosis. There you are. Uh, so it has to be large enough to be able to produce that much amount. So it has got lost in between your other usual complaints. Please understand how do you fetch marks. So I will put it down this way. There is history of excessive salivation and difficulty of speech. While there is no history of halitosis, bleeding, stadia, or difficulty in mouth opening. There is no history of cough or neck, any neck swelling and no history of any significant weight loss. She has not told you any amount of weight loss. You have not asked her also. She can't quantify it sometimes. It could be very little, but it's not a common problem with tongue cancer. So you could put it down in that format. Okay. Let's you know, your marking in the mind of the examiner has started the moment you start presenting your history. So don't think I will hit all my sixes when I'm discussing the case. They are already scored. 50% marks are scored as you start presenting and then you go through are you getting my point? Yes. Be very, very careful about history also. Don't use casual terms. Examiner makes an impression. If he's a good examiner, he makes a good impression. Next slide. Now, let's look at this. You are so obsessed with similar complaints in the past. I've already covered that. So, please don't mention it. There is no such history. Be specific with past history. What past history you would like to take in any patient with oral cancer or oral lesion? Uh, uh, any uh, tooth extraction in sense. Right. So be specific. No history of any dental intervention in one. No history of ill-fitting dentures in the past. Now you've got a history. That's okay. And you mentioned that. No history of tooth extraction two years ago. So that history is suggestive. Yes. At the same time, you mentioned no history of similar complaints in the past. It kills the other two histories that are positive. I would put the positive history in front because they are more useful to me. That is, there is a history of tooth extraction followed by dentures fixed two years ago and there is frequent irritation of dentures. That is, there is an ill-fitting denture. This would have been your presenting complaint because it's a problem. And no history of other comorbidities, no history of high-risk behavior, no history of any radiation exposure in the past. You have put anything wherever. So, I will start like this. Patient is a known diabetic on treatment. There is a significant history of tooth extraction and ill-fitting dentures. Subsequent to that. No history of any other comorbidities or high-risk behavior. And there is no history of any radiational exposure in the past. Let's move. This has been taken well. Mixed diet, normal sleep, appetite, normal bowel and bladder habits, no known allergies. Who is interested in the rest of the stuff? What is important is present. History of beetle net suit for 15 years. That should happen before. Because we are interested in that. What she doesn't have is useful. But, you know, not the bowel and bladder habits in the up. So you're not putting it in the perspective in the order of importance. And what I'm trying to tell you is your order is what decides the examiner's mind as to your priorities. So personal history. Patient has normal sleep and appetite 
and normal bowel bladder habits. It goes in one line, takes a mixed diet, and has history of beetle and chewing for 15 years. I would be more interested in the pattern of beetle and chewing. What does she do? Does she put a quid in the night or she keeps it in the daytime? She does it, does she keep it in the lateral sulcus or she keeps in the anterior sulcus? What was the pattern? So she uh, just chew in the morning and throw it out. So that is important for us, right? So what is its significance to us? Sir, uh, uh, in case of if she put it in the lateral sulcus as a quid, there is a higher dome, uh, duration of the exposure, which results in the tense. So, uh, good, good. so you're trying to say both the factors are important. One, duration. she keeps it and for how long she keeps it. Correct? And then what form of tobacco she takes that you yes. mentioned, the smokeless form. It's a smokeless form of tobacco in the form of a quid, which no quid, she just chews it and throws it. Now, they have relationship. What is the relevance of contact time? So, more the contact time, more early will be the... Naturally. So, what is the relationship? How does it work out? Well, if it is more than 6 hours, more than 12 hours, more than um, 24 hours, they vary. Some people keep it all the time. So the contact time along with poor hygiene, which is what is responsible for the bacteria there, will convert the nitrous to nicotine into nitrosamines. And that is what is one aspect of it. The second aspect is if it stays for a longer time, it does exactly what, you know, the DNA changes with human papilloma virus do or alcohol does, taking away the repair reparative capability of the mucosa. So they are not able to re, uh, reconstruct or re create themselves. So the contact time is important and that is what is important. And in your personal history, what is a menstrual cycle doing? You are unnecessarily doing this problem. Menstrual history is a very significant different history. Unless there is anything relevant, you are wasting your time, my time with the children being too normal vaginal delivery. Now this is all right. But in personal history, this won't fit in. Even you know that. So I won't spend time there. That is natural. Let's move. Family history, again the same. No significant history of similar illness in the family. What is the illness, first of all? How would the patient know what is the illness? Are you getting my point? You are expecting the patient to tell you, sir, there is no family history of tongue cancer in my first degree relative. She is not going to tell you. So you could be more specific in all family histories in cancers, wherever. There is no significant family history of hereditary cancers of any kind. Yeah. You are out of it straight away. These are casual statements. Like I told you previously, there is no similar illness stuff. We do not know what is her illness today, so she cannot tell you. What you are saying is, she is what is not, not, not present in the family? Ill-fitting dentures or the ulcer? Because she has both problems. No, no. You can be forced you can be specific. Yes, there is no history of any ulcers in the oral cavity. That is impossible because ulcers will happen day in and day out. But they may not always be related to the problem. So this is a wrong statement. You have just taken it casually. What you are trying to say is there is no family history of any head and neck cancers or other cancers in the family. So that you can put a point of view across. Okay. Does tongue cancer run in the families? Sir, uh... Answer is no. So if it does not, we don't know. Maybe it does. We don't know as of now. But yes, some head and neck cancers do run in the family and they may happen in the tongue also. So what you can bail yourself out by saying is, Sir, I'm ruling out any other cancer because there is a cancer family concept. They have breast cancer, head and neck cancer. We don't know how they're connected, but that's what we want to find out. Allergic history, no significant, not significant, or there is no allergy, there is no history of allergy. Treatment history, no treatment received so far for the present disease. So what I'm trying to tell you is, put this important history in perspective. The non-significant ones can disappear in the miscellaneous group so that you don't waste any time. And you're able to score with some significant punches. Don't waste time on left, right, and yeah. I mean, 
okay. regarding treatment history, when the patient comes to your exam table, patient might have undergone some investigation, at least a biopsy or some investigation. You can say that patient underwent a biopsy or patient underwent some investigation. You may not be knowing what the investigation done, but you say no treatment received is not a right statement when you're in the exam table because patient has gone through OPD and then come to indoor and then came for your exam table. So mention that, what patient can tell you. What actually, Dr. Saar, the problem is the, he, he's probably not understanding this. They are, most of them, they have the issue. They probably are not aware of what is the relevance of asking. You see, we want to know the treatment history so that it is relevant to the case. And in your case, you're wrong. Patient has received treatment in the form of denti dental intervention, which is significant to us. Whatever treatment in the duration is important. Ill-fitting dentures happen following an intervention only. You getting my point? But what you are trying to say was no treatment for this cancer or this ulcer. So now it's not falling into place. For that, as Dr. Saha said, something would have been done. Even blood investigations done, painkiller given, oral mouthwash given, antiseptics for the oral cavity given, biopsy done. They are all intervention. Why mention it? There is no requirement unless it is significant. You see, treatment history is important if it is contributing to your diagnosis. Any history is important if it is contributing to your diagnosis or ruling out some other differential. Please move on. Please start. So patient examined in a visit room with proper consent and in the presence of a female attendant. Patient uh, is alert, conscious, cooperative. Karnofsky's performance score was 80. Built average, gait normal, facies normal, hydration normal, nutrition status was poor. There is a no anemia, joint disc, uh, sinusitis, clogging, edema present. Pulse was 78 per minute regular. Blood pressure was 120 by 70 mm millimeter of mercury. Respiratory rate was 12 per minute. Uh, she she was taken right. Sir, I yeah, carry on, carry on. See, your journal examination is routine. Right. Go back to the first slide. Now, good that Karnofsky's score is becoming 80 now. Otherwise, you all make everybody 90. Whether he likes it, she likes it. So, 80 is all right. That is if you think it is 80. I don't think you should put down everything in the order that you've just put it taking it out of the book. Book has described these points. They need to be amalgamated. Patient was examined in a well-lit room after proper consent and in the presence of a female chevron was found to be alert, conscious, cooperative with a performance status of 80 by Karnofsky. Was an av of average built and the nutrition was poor. The gait was normal. The faces were normal. That is if you are looking at the faces. Next slide. And rest of the examination was within normal limits. Because no clubbing, colonic, cyanosis, nutrients, etc. They are not always present. So if they are normal, you can skip it. Let's come to the examination of the oral cavity. Okay. You know, I, I don't think this is the correct statement because you are examining the head and neck as a whole. Yeah. You cannot examine the oral cavity and mention facial symmetry. Okay, and in any case, it's a good attempt that you mentioned the facial symmetry, commissures, uh, etc. But it is examination of the head and neck. Please start. On inspection, the facial symmetry maintained, mouth opening was adequate, commissures and the lips were normal, no any patches noted in that, inside the mouth for cavity. Buccal mucosa, gingival buccal sulcus, gingival labial sulcus were normal, tongue, a single ulcerative proliferative lesion noted of size which was 2 cm. Side, right lateral border of the tongue extending into the ventral surface. The extent was anteriorly 4 cm from the tongue, posteriorly just proximal to the junction of uh, anterior 2 third and posterior 1 third of the tongue, medially 2 cm from the midline, laterally present along the right lateral margin of the tongue. The lesion doesn't process the midline. The uh, margin, the Margin of the ulcer was irregular, edges were raised and diverted, surface was irregular. On examination of the floor, slough present, no active discharge or bleeding from the ulcer noted. No deviation of the tongue on protrusion noted. Next. 
the floor of the mouth was normal mouth opening was normal dental formula as explained here dental placed for the second upper right incisor sharp tooth noted in the first upper right molar staining of the tooth noted no dental caries seen retromolar trigone normal hard and soft palate are normal anterior and posterior pillars normal no tonsillar enlargement tubular in midline posterior pharyngeal wall were normal finish up finish up finish up the examination Okay. On palpation, all my inspective findings of size, shape, and extent confirmed by palpation. Tenderness present. Size was three cross two centimeter. Variable in consistency. Base was firm. No induration noted in the floor of the mouth. Ulcer is not extending into the posterior one third of the tongue. Ulcer doesn't bleed on touch. Gingival buccal, gingival lingual sulcus were normal. Examination of neck. A single one cross point five centimeter mobile firm, non tender. Oval shaped rings not palpated in the submandibular region. Contral and lateral neck no note notes palpable. So in the same slide I have written the examination of ninth, tenth, and twelfth cranial nerves were normal. Examination of scalp, ear, nose, and throat were normal. Examination of spine was normal. Other systemic examinations were within normal limits. Yeah, you summarize. A forty-four years uh, lady presented with history of brittle neck chewing and ill-fitting denture following tooth extraction. Presented with an ulcerative progressive growth over the right side of the tongue for the last three months, which gradually increases in the size and associated with excessive salivation, pain, and referred to colgia to ipsilateral ear. On examination, an ulcerative proliferative growth of three cross two centimeter present over the right lateral border, extending into the ventral surface of the anterior two third of the tongue, variable in consistency. Yeah, floor of the mouth uh, normal with right cervical ring pedina. What is this variable in consistency? I was just wondering. He mentioned about surface also. There is nothing called surface in the ulcer. ulcer what you no. see is a floor, and what you palpate is a base. So there is nothing called surface in ulcer, and there is we don't describe the consistency of ulcer itself. Because ulcer is a breach. You cannot assess, assess the consistency. You can assess the In duration at the base. Yes, in duration, no sir. Which you mentioned is absent. So, uh, you mentioned there is no in duration of the base, which is very unusual. Let me tell you, because even if it is an inflammatory ulcer, there will be some bit of in duration, unless it's so superficial that it has no depth at all, because it will infiltrate deeper. I think I will take your head and neck examination from the beginning. Although, let me tell you, you made a good presentation. It's a good cover of most aspects. Now, I'm just making it better. So, examination of the head and neck. I examined the patient in a sitting position with me standing in front at the same level. Right. The facial okay. is maintained. Mouth opening is adequate. The lips and the commissures are normal. If they're normal, why would you notice any patch? So, there are. That's out. No, they're normal. Now, buccal mucosa, gingival buccal sulcus, gingival labial sulcus—they are normal. Tongue has got a single ulcero proliferative lesion, which is of the size three to two centimeters, located on the right lateral border, extending into the ventral surface. Next, next slide. It is—you never give a reference from the tip of the tongue, or tongue is a mobile structure. So, give a reference of the teeth in tongue or buccal mucosa. Reference is taken of a fixed point. So we always refer from this incisor to this molar to whatever. But I get what you are saying. Posteriorly, just proximal to the junction of anterior two third and posterior one third. While later on you mentioned that it's not extending onto the posterior one third of the tongue. <coughs> so it's not possible to comment on that. Therefore, it is safer to just mention the range. And the significance is oral tongue is posterior one third of the tongue. Sorry, anterior two third of the tongue, and pharyngeal tongue is the posterior one third of the tongue. So you need to understand that difference. Now, medially two centimeter from midline. When you have described the lateral position, you don't need to describe the position from midline. The moment you say not crossing the midline, that's fine. Otherwise, the ulcer is on the lateral edge, so it has to be away from the midline. Laterally present along the right lateral margin of tongue. This is what I was saying. It is present along the right lateral margin. How would it be two centimeter from the midline? It's away from the midline anyway. 
and does not cross the midline, you have emphasized again. If it is all, if you mention that it is two centimeters from midline, naturally it is not crossing. Right? You are mentioning that it is so far away from the midline. So now can you say it is crossing? So they are mutually exclusive, excluding statements. Next slide. <coughs> now you are describing the ulcer. Okay. Margins. It's not margin. They are irregular. All margins. Edges raised and everted. Be careful. You look at the picture. Posterior edge is not as everted. So you would be clear on that. There is no surface of an ulcer, as Dr. Shah mentioned, because how can you have an ulcer of a surface of a swimming pool? Ulcer is similar to a swimming pool without water. What you see is the floor. What you walk on is the margin. What is connecting the two is the edge. Mother Earth is the base. Where is the question of any surface? If there was a surface, there would be no ulcer. Now, floor has slough, no active discharge or bleeding from the ulcer noted. No deviation of tongue of on protrusion noted. That is fine. No deviation of the tongue. What does it mean when you protrude the tongue? Sir, in, sir involvement of the hyoglossal nerve. Involvement of the? Hypo. Hyoglossal nerve, sir. Hyo nerve. Single nerve Hypo. Hypo. As of now, we have not named any Hypo. nerve that way. Hypoglossal, Hypoglossal nerve. Hypoglossal. But why should it move? Is it only the involvement of hypoglossal nerve that will produce... The muscles of the tongue also, sir. Yes. So involvement of the muscles of the tongue. Use the term extrinsic muscles of the tongue. Sorry. Extrinsic muscles. Extrinsic. Which are the muscles that are extrinsic? Sir, uh, genioglossus, hyoglossus, palatoglossus, and spiroglossus. Probably that's where you missed out. That I wanted you to narrate it. So genioglossus will protrude. That is its function. And if the one, one side is failing away to the same side. What is that called? What is this phenomenon called? When tongue deviates to the same side, following the involvement of hypoglossal nerve or involvement of the muscle. It's called wheelbarrow phenomenon. You've seen a wheelbarrow? Yes, sir. You've seen it, no? Thela jo hota hai. Yes, sir. If it breaks, it falls to the same side. Now, not bleeding on touch can happen here only when you palpate. Next slide. Now, if you really look at this ulcer, although the picture is blurred, it is extending more than you mentioned, and the edges are different. At one point, they are raised, and it's not unusual. When they're progressing in one direction, they have more proliferation. At the same time, you cannot say that induration is not there at all. So be careful when you're presenting. I can't go and touch it and show it to you now in this case, but be careful about the base. Most of these ulcers would have induration in the base, which is beyond the lesions, in tongue especially. Next slide. This is fine. I really like your dental formula being put there because this is a case where it has a significance. And uh, this the same emphasis we wanted in the history that would have helped. When you say floor of the mouth, normal, mouth opening, normal. The term is adequate. There's, not, there's no such thing as normal mouth opening. It varies from individuals to individuals. But what is adequate mouth opening? So more than three centimeters. Between what? Between two incisors, sir. To say that, no so inter incisor distance of at least three centimeters. three centimeters. So adequate would be more than three centimeters. You're right. Why did you take that history in this case? Sir, to see whether involvement of the uh, Involvement of the sir, uh, perigoid muscle or the extension of the... It's a very common error. This lesion is very far from there. But still the mouth opening may be restricted because in restricted mouth opening is not always trismus. Trismus is painful restricted mouth opening which happens due to pterygoids or masseter involvement. But painless mouth opening can be restricted in submucous fibrosis. Or all tobacco chewers can have restricted mouth opening, if you notice. But it is pain-free. Right? So, therefore, mouth opening is important. And when you mention about no ulcer seen, is it possible, if you go back to the picture, you will have some leukoplakic patches and melanoplakic patches, and tobacco staining would be seen. Or she is not taking tobacco. 
even in this bad picture, I can tell you the teeth have some kind of a stain, which is not surprising. It is naturally there. People who take tobacco will have some teeth staining with the tobacco. But do not say this. We are interested in oral precancers. They are not precancerous lesions. They are precancers. You know the difference. I won't go there. Next slide. You mentioned no dental caries present. Go back, please. Sorry. Staining of tooth is noted. Now, all of you would agree with me that the important findings disappear in the non-significant negative findings. So, I'll start by mentioning the teeth are stained with nicotine. And I will deliberately search for any leukoplakic, melanoplakic, erythroplakic patches which will be present. And then the rest, staining of tooth present, a sharp tooth notice, important for us. And no dental care is seen. Be careful about that. Oral hygiene is maintained. Next slide. This is fine. They were required. And you mentioned it. But please don't miss if there are any precancerous lesions or precancers in the oral cavity. Next slide. Now, tenderness present where? Sir, over the ulcer, sir. So, sir, you have over the ulcer is again a wrong term. The base is tender. Right? Indurated, which you, which you said is not present. What is variable inconsistency? Sir, the induration and the sir, ulcer. Will... How would an ulcer's consistency be ascertained if it doesn't have a complete wall? Yeah. It's a base only. So don't try to complete the checklist by putting terms unnecessarily. The base is firm. Now what is a firm base and what is an indurated base? You've written no induration. In the floor of the mouth. See, they, there you are. I am once, for a moment I am taken to the ulcer, then I come to the mouth. So we get lost. Finish with the ulcer completely. The rest of the mouth is normal. If it is normal, then there is no question of any induration. You mentioned that there or now. Again, back to ulcer. Why should I talk about the mouth when I am talking about the tongue? And then ulcer is extending into the posterior one third of the not extending. Doesn't bleed on touch. Then gingival lingual sulcus is normal. So please finish with the ulcer first. Okay. And then come to the other sites. These are all subsites no, in the oral cavity. You're all subside which you have covered. Correct? Next slide. We'll say one time. That's why I want to be quick with it. Now, examination of the neck. A single. A and single are one. Same thing. You don't say only one single. That is also the same thing. So there is level 1B lymph node that is palpable, which is about 1 into 0.5 centimeters of 1 to 0.5 centimeter at level 1b the there are no other there, there are no other lymph nodes palpable and describe it properly oval shape no lymph node is oval shape oval is one axis oval is a picture you draw it will be ovoid and very difficult to ascertain unless you are so clever at it mostly it is enlarged Spheroidal or ovoid, that is possible, but not oval. Right? Some mandibular regions. When you are saying level 1B, don't bother about some mandibular regions. Examination of the cranial nerve, 9, 12, 10, 12 is normal. Scalp, etc. is normal. Examination of spine. Which part of spine? Cervical. Please, sir, mention that. If there are metastases, where do you feel for tenderness? Sir. Not on the spine center, paraspinal region. Please read about it. I, I, or you can watch our video. Now, coming to uh, this, uh, your no, no, go back, please. Yes. So be specific. Here you should mention examination of cervical spine. Here, nose, throat, and scalp is normal. Perfect. Next slide. He has uh, presented well. That, that what wants ah, to cover. I am putting things. Yeah, in yeah. For you, because but few things are not recorded. That should keep in mind. That no, even if they, you want to put them in the right. If you put them in the right place, they'll look nice. 
and importantly you put the whole uh, you know food on the dining table i'm trying to organize it for you so yes. that you learn to put it properly across yes. you, know, you can't start with the pudding and then come to the chapati yes. <laughs> so put it in the right perspective that's what i'm trying to teach you and it's not about putting everything on the table now the person has to decide to eat history presentation and examination is like serving a well prepared dish if you have not prepared it well there is no question of serving a rotten dish so that part is taken care of but presenting it is important be very careful ergonomically etc okay this is fine let's move on now in your summary we have already corrected that now for 44 year lady there is no female or male a known tobacco chewer no history of history no tobacco chewer with ill fitting denture now you put a denture only after tooth extraction sir so don't unnecessarily repeat the history here in summary as an ulcero qualitative growth on the right side of the tongue which is gradually been increasing in size with excessive salivation and relative i mean all that stuff you can carry on and come to the diagnosis now sir a 44 A provisional diagnosis is a 44-year lady with a progressive ulcerative proliferative tongue lesion on right lateral aspect, uh, most likely a case of carcinoma tongue. Clinically, T2, N1, N0, stage 3 disease. Okay, we'll discuss that. You examined all the cranial nerves. What was the significance here, sir? Uh, in in what <laughs> examination of nine, ten, and twelve, no, sir. Yes. Yes. Sir, uh, if the uh, nerve involvement uh, is a uh, suggestion of the advanced disease, sir. Oh no! Why? Why? Where? I am asking you this question because many examiners will ask you this question because they don't think it is necessary in all the cases. Although I am with you, but I would like to know you so that you are able to answer the question. Otherwise, there is no point asking. Where are they coming out from? So indirectly, see nine, ten, and twelve. Twelve you have answered already. It could be either the direct invasion into the muscle or of the nerve, which is coming through the submandibular triangle, or right at the skull base. The other nerves right at the skull base. I am not asking you the up the what what is an upturned cut in sign. How do you look for look for tenth or ninth? Sir, by uh, asking patient to say A uh, and B, it's I mean the uvula and the uh, soft palate. So you look at the soft palate, the one which is normal moves up, and the one which is not normal doesn't move up, like this or like this. So there is, if you have seen the old, uh, uh, you know, um, theaters or puja pandals where they'll do these plays, the children will have one person who lifts the curtain for you. And there are two curtains, so he pulls up one. One is up, then he runs to the other side to pull the other one. That is how it used to happen in the past. All it's all remote now. That is called upturned curtain sign, which means ninth nerve involvement. And tenth is the gag reflex, or even with this, the movement of the uvula. So they are important for higher up lesions or some lesion there. Why should it be relevant here? It's such a small lesion. Why are you trying to know? Sir, if these will be involved, the tumor, the vision will be on the surface. So, sir, first of all, know why you are doing it. In all tobacco cures, there is an entity called as field cancerization, or multiple similar cancers in the same epithelium. So, she may be having one here, but there is another one behind, which you may not notice. Therefore, no clinical examination of the oral cavity is complete without. Direct laryngoscopy. You should know it. I didn't disturb it when you are presenting. That is to score a distinction if you want to. That's a part of office procedures now, clinical part, because you cannot see other lesions without using it. Because you can't see the posterior one third of the tongue or the base, as they call it. You said pharynx is normal. Only the part you could see. That is why it has been. Put. So you may have multiple lesions. There will be another lesion somewhere which could produce this picture. Okay, what is this? Is this a complete staging, or you would like to do more? Sir, in the 
So depth of the invasion has been increased. So you would like to mention it that I would want it. This is your clinical stage, so we're not bothered. It is CT two N one M zero. How is it T two? Sir, uh, more than uh, two centimeter, less than four centimeter. And sir, the depth of invasion, sir, I haven't checked, but sir, in T two the the depth of invasion should be sir, if more than uh, if uh, two to four centimeter depth of invasion should be less than five mm, and ah, if five, less than ten, fifteen and more, that's it. Yes. So. You should be aware of it. We are not repeating it. <laughs> EOI is important. What else is important for the node? AJCC attention. So you would qualify like you do in breast. All is mentioned, sir. This is my clinical stage. However, I would be able to give a complete stage based on depth of invasion and extra nodal extension, which I will know only on ultrasound. Please do it. Also, the neck is an extension of clinical examination, right? And clinically, if the node was fixed, you'll take it as extra nodal extension only. But here, you have a mobile lymph node, and how do you know it is not a submandibular gland? Because it's very common in poor hygiene in these patients. How do you know it's a lymph yes, node, not a no, not a gland? What is the clinical differentiation? How do you know it's a submandibular lymph node, not a submandibular gland? Very old, beaten question. Say you know or you don't know. Don't waste time. I'll tell you. Right. Yes. Yeah, so you should know it. This is something which would be more fundamental to your passing. The lymph node. If you ever have seen the neck dissection, the lymph node lies superficial to the gland also, and gland has two parts. One which goes under the mylohyde. So the by digital examination is going to be. I mean, it will it will be present in uh, some mandibular uh, some mandibular gland. It will be by digitally palpable. Don't say by manually. Manual means both hands inside. Digital by digitally palpable is some mandibular gland. Lymph node is not by digitally palpable. Will you remember this for future? Yes. So there has to be differentiation. Otherwise, lymph node and submandibular gland are almost there, and very commonly it's the gland which is enlarged. All right, how do you proceed now, sir? I would like to do some investigation to confirm the diagnosis. For this, I will go for the you know, bridge biopsy from the ulcer uh, along with the healthy part of the tongue. <coughs> and sir, I will I will do some investigation to stage the disease. For staging, I will go for the uh, MRI of the neck, the MRI of the uh, head and neck, sir. I didn't stop you. Please finish, then I'll ask. You. And then, Don't sir, skip I ultrasound. Go. Don't skip ultrasound. Before MRI, you should uh, mm -hmm. tell us ultra. As Dr. Chitamal already said, it's an extension of clinical examination. So ultrasound sir. can give an idea about the neck. Sir, I will do also, sir, uh, ultrasound of the neck. And sir, uh, now, uh, if you have stopped, then we tell you so that we say one time. As rightly pointed out, when you are putting the stage CT two and then qualify yourself there only, sir. I would like to do an ultrasound of the neck to know the node stage, which is the easiest way to pick it up. It also tells you about extra nodal extension. It tells you about the number of nodes. It tells you about the contralateral node. It tells you about the IJV, carotid, base of skull, everything. Ultrasound is very useful. The only problem is it is operator dependent. Who is doing it is important. If you are doing it, you may not find those features. Second, you have mentioned in clinical examination, I'd extend by you doing indirect laryngoscopy or pharyngoscopy. A lot of people do that. They sit in the clinic and do it. Next, you move to investigations to confirm the diagnosis, to stage the disease, to treat the patient. Mention in one breath so that the examiner is answered throughout your answer. He may not ask you about the details of each one. Now, what do you do to confirm? Edge biopsy, edge biopsy, biopsy from the anterior part, not the posterior part. Need to highlight that. Why from the edge? Sir, uh, to include the normal tissue also, as sir, maximum proliferation takes place at the. That is outdated. Maximum, what maximum is more, proliferation. Yes, so edge is proliferation, and yes, <laughs> to give the normal tissue. It's no longer to compare with the abnormal. It is sometimes to pick up the in situ disease, which you may miss out on gross. Examination, so that's why wedge is good, but take it entirely, right? So that you don't extend the margin. 
Suppose the report comes as equivocal. This is very common in the oral cavity. The patient's report has gone. Pathologist says equivocal. I can't make out. What do you suspect? Answer or I'll answer. Sir, See, very commonly they have superadded infection. So do not do biopsy without a good oral mouthwash for a couple of days. Or if you've found a DP vocal report, put the patient on an antiseptic oral mouthwash or antibiotics and repeat it after one week. Don't change the pathologies. You've not put it the right way. And be careful. You take a proper chunk. Don't be miserly with it. You mentioned the ulcer does not bleed on touch. Why do they bleed on touch? Sir, it's due to the granulation issue. Due to? Granulation issue. Now, that is where a student keeps on getting exposed. Please be careful. Granulation does not happen in cancers. Granulation is a healing ulcer. Is it a healing what, ulcer? What happens in the neoplastic ulcer? Does, does the vascularity changes? Yes, sir. Vascularity increase. Change. No, that is not answered. You took a hint. You just repeated what he said. He already said, he is your... Neovascular, he's... neovascular. No, beta. There, there is a neovascularization with weak calp capillaries that have no strength in the wall. So they were fragile. That's why on touching, they bleed. Clear? Now, please remember it for future. And for God's sake, do not say uh, granulation, which would contradict all your findings. The cancer doesn't have granulation. Cancer has proliferation. Okay, so there is angi new angiogenesis of weak capillaries, which are very fragile. So you've taken a biopsy, it may bleed. That's why I, suddenly I remembered I'll ask you. And uh, biopsy comes as moderately differentiated common cell carcinoma of the tongue. You said, I'll do MRI for staging of the disease. Why not a CT? Sir, uh, CT cannot actually tell the thickness of the lesion, sir. Which was the so there are three parts to your stage. No, T, N, and M. You have to get all three right. So for T, yes, I understand MRI is good. Because it will tell you the depth of the lesion, extent of the lesion. And we need to see whether it's crossing the midline inside. Because we need to conserve the tongue as much as we can. Organ preservation is our key here. MRI is good. I'm not saying we'll not do MRI. Also, MRI tells you about the floor of the mouth. Uh, the surrounding soft tissue. There is bone also there close by. So either you'll do both CT and MRI. Otherwise for nodes, CT is considered slightly superior. But if you add ultrasound to MRI, even that is a good enough idea. You getting my point? Yes. Don't be obsessed with this MRI. That is correct. Oropharynx MRI, correct. But for the nodes also, you need to be careful. So be prepared for both. So you would say for finding out the extent of the disease, primary, that is T. See, cancer is all T, N, N, M. Mm -hmm. of T, N, N, M. Examination for T, N, N, M. Investigation for T, N, N, M. Treatment for T, N, N, M. That's the story of cancer. That's how you do it. Coming to the nodes in the neck, ultrasound is a very sensitive investigation and you may not need it. But a lot of us would like to do a CT. But it's, it's fine. What you're saying, we have understood. You want to see that soft tissue if you want to say that soft tissue is better seen on MRI. You've seen it. And any role of doing in the same breath, you should also say, I've already looked for field cancerization, which is important. Field cancerization is a very important finding because the radiation that you give later on can make the side to cancers into frank cancers of recurrences. New primaries happen in these patients very common. Let's it see. should be ENT checkup, sir. It should be ENT the checkup. Direct laryngoscopy with a proper ENT checkup. Mm -hmm. And you have already done CT and neck from skull base to cervicals. MRI for the tongue, which if you are very rich. Otherwise, don't need it all the time. It's not so important unless you find a very great significance. With ultrasound also, they are able to pick up all those things that you pick up. Like they say, the rich man's ultrasound is MRI. A poor man's MRI is ultrasound. It depends where you are and what you want to see. How do you manage it now? You have two minutes, three minutes to cover it. Sir, I will go for the wide local excision of the lesion with uh, one centimeter margin. Along with, I will uh, uh, do the sir, modified radical neck section. And sir, I do the reconstruction. Afterwards. Okay. All three statements are copybook, which means you have not seen it. Your answer should start by, I'll discuss the case in the MDT because you can't take all the decisions. 
and I'll plan the extent of surgery with patient counseling because the part of the tongue is going to go, speech will be affected, salivation would be affected, um, swallowing would be affected. So with three-dimensional clearance to the margin of 1 to 1.5 centimeters. If you say with a margin of 1.5, 1 centimeter, it's a wrong answer, sir. Please remember it for future. Head and neck cancers, three-dimensional because it's a cavity. You can't have one extent only. So three-dimensional clearance with a clear margin and you mentioned I'll reconstruct. Why would you reconstruct? Why would you primarily repair? So because the defect will be larger than one third of the tongue. If the defect is more than 20%, they say 30%, you need to reconstruct. Otherwise, you may just about repair it. It does not cause any problem, especially with lateral lesions. You can have some bit of snake tongue if you do anteriorly, but laterally there is no problem. The usual statement for your answer is 20 to 30 percent loss. Then you may need to reconstruct. What would you reconstruct it with? Sir, uh, radial forearm feature. See, you are saying all those things that are very fancy and you may not have seen. Have you seen radial artery forearm wrap? Why did you choose this one specially so that you won't you can be nailed easily? They're very easy flaps, local flaps. Yeah. Which will be platysmal flap, buccal flap. Steromestoid flap, forehead, forehead flap, they are so easily available without any morbidity. Free flap, if you have ever seen it, it takes about four to five hours, it's very expensive, and theatre time extends, patient will be morbidly ill. So your answer should be there are options available. So don't say radial artery forearm flaps. So sir, there are options of axial flap, which may be local or PMMC, BP, or you may have forehead, or local flaps like buccal, platysmal <laughs> flap, or you can take free flaps like radial artery forearm flaps or anterolateral thigh flap, etc. These are options. Why should you come in? Secondly, you mentioned modified radical neck dissection. Tie. So type, uh, I will try for type three, sir. Yes, you should try for type three, and the term is now therefore selective neck dissection. Mentioning the levels removed and the structure safe. You don't need to uh, say MRND all the time. Sendy with level 1 to 5, preserving SAN, IJV, and uh, SCM if I can. Otherwise, I'll just mention what I've removed. That is how you can do it because that BOCAS classification of MRND 1, type 2, th type 3 is no longer used. So that's fine. How about? adjuvant treatment which you should have covered in one go. So I, will, so I will go for the radiotherapy. Sir. So you can answer therefore, uh, Dr. Pandey, it's a good idea that I'll plan the patient, I'll treat the patient, you'll treat the T and N and M, all three are there. For T, I do, that is I'm going to do a wide local excision with three dimensional clearance with a margin of 1 to 1.5 centimeter. Reconstruction, if there's more than 20% loss, which I'll only know when I've done it, but I don't foresee in your case, along with right-sided modified radical neck dissection or selective neck dissection, preserving all the vital structures, followed by adjuvant radiation. Again, this we have already discussed it in the MD. Yeah, we should discuss it because uh, routine radiation... Uh, you have to consider indication. some points. What what radiation? What are the indications? Quickly, sir. A positive margin, positive lens node, and uh, hybrid. The answer is you no. Know, positive margin is always a shabby word. You should go back and operate. Depth of invasion. It's important. Secondly, grade of the tumor. Okay, and the final P size, PT, PT and M will decide that. Okay, and they look in take into consideration extent of lymphovascular invasion. Grade of the tumor, and yes, margin is a crunch criteria, but so the decision would be taken again based on surgery and histology in one breath. And, and if you have done a adequate neck dissection, unless there is external extension, there is no indication for uh, reading the neck. There is no radiation to the neck, that is a usual take, and it's only the lesion that needs to be radiated. And you can have local radiation now in the form of either brachytherapy 
or IMRT and IGRT, which is image guided radiation and intensity modulated radiation. Neck, we try to exclude if your neck dissection is optimal. That's the case everywhere. And you should have started. I'm just adding, I'm going back. You should have started by saying, sir, I will counsel the patient, psychotherapy, she has to abstain from tobacco. Quality of life, she has to be given the, you know, the initial orientation towards the surgery and the outcome. And then rehabilitation post-surgery is very important. Use those terms to earn more points. Do you have any question? Sir, uh, I want to know the indication of supramoid neck dissection, sir. Then indication for supramoid neck dissections are zero. Uh, they are selective neck dissection. There is nothing like indication for supramoid. Please listen to me carefully. The term is either you do elective neck dissection, which was called prophylactic earlier. Elective neck dissection is usually SND 1, 2, 3. So it is supramohyoid except in tongue, where it will be ultra supramohyoid, where you will take out level 4 also. If there is a high propensity for skip metastasis, especially level 4. So then supramohyoid will be obsolete. That's not the term you use. Supramohyoid will be above the level 4. No? So the answer is elective neck dissection is done. Large tumor that is T size more than 4. Grade more than 4 centimeters. It's 0 to 2, 2 to 4, more than 4, right? So, and bad grade, lymphovascular invasion. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And accidentally, when you're doing surgery, I'm talking about all oral cavity, you are already in the neck. Sometimes when you're resecting the lesion, the neck is already open. Then you would rather do a, a supramoid neck dissection. Some people in good cancers and good uh, sent uh, good cancers and well differentiated cancers in younger patients do they do supramoid even in node positive disease but that is not your problem right because they've observed that involvement of level 4 and level 5 is so rare that you may skip it but that's not the case we don't practice it elective neck dissection is done to avoid radiation to the neck later on sometimes radiology radiotherapists may like to radiate the neck so it's better to have surgery than Radiation. Radiation has got more morbidity. So indications are number one, depth of invasion would be a criteria of post-surgery and your uh, you know, uh, grade of the tumor would be important. Thirdly, on table, when you're opening up for the, you know, whatever surgery you're doing, you're already in the neck. You try to do. These are classical indications. And usually, elective is done in no negative disease, as correctly pointed out. Rarely, some people like to do in good cancers with less depth of invasion, no positive disease also, but that's not what you're going to say. And it is not supramohyoid in tongue. It is 1, 2, 3, 4. Elsewhere, it is 1, 2, 3. Got the answer? Yes, sir. Can we close, Dr. Shah? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have first nine. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is this is what a model uh, uh, case scenario should go. Uh, we are not very high questions. These are all usual uh, questions that is being asked in the standard DNB or MS examination. You may not be asked for so, so much of time. Maybe you have to ask for 20 minutes. So you can understand that uh, depth of question will be much less. But you have covered the whole uh, uh, topic completely. It's a pleasure, Dr. Sa. Always a joy to be with you. Thank you, and sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great day. Anish, all the very best for your future. Thank you, Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. You presented well. Thank you, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir.